How do okay. you say? Hi, Yang. Thanks yeah. for joining us. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Okay, well, welcome back from, uh, from summer. Hopefully uh, people had a nice summer, had a chance to uh, get a break, if not travel, uh, but travel is uh, slowly becoming possible. Uh, so we're uh, really pleased to get, uh, get started on the, uh, the fall session of the uh, Machine Learning Interest Group uh, uh, speakers. We actually have uh, four speakers lined up already for the fall. Uh, but uh, uh, as you know, we're always looking for uh, people to volunteer. Uh, volunteer yourself or volunteer somebody else. We'll take a, a human sacrifice as well uh, for, uh, for, the, for the next year, 2022. Uh, so without cutting into uh, 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 Dr. Yang Wang's uh, time, I'm just gonna quickly say that this is a very exciting uh, uh, topic area self-adaptive visual learning. Uh, as you can see from the intro slide, uh, uh, Dr. Yang, uh, Wang is uh, 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 affiliated with a number of groups. Uh, uh, he's currently actually uh, uh, working uh, with the University of Toronto remotely, still in Winnipeg, and uh, so is uh, uh, very deep into uh, computer vision and uh, obviously is very uh, sought after uh, uh, as a researcher. So. Uh, with, uh, with that, uh, welcome and thank you very much for, uh, for uh, uh, offering to speak. Okay, great. Thanks, Bill, uh, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, hello, everyone. So it's great to see everyone uh, virtually uh, after such a long time. Uh, yeah, so as Bill mentioned, so I'm, uh, I'm currently uh, affiliated with the uh, University of Manitoba, but I'm on leave right now and working as a chief scientist in computer vision at Huawei in Canada. The, the lab is in Toronto, but uh, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, I've been working uh, remotely from Winnipeg uh, uh, for now. Uh, okay, so today I'm going to talk about some of the topics I'm very excited about. I call it the self-adaptive visual learning. Uh, so uh, first I should say that the talk is prepared mostly for um, computer science audience, but I know that uh, there are a lot of people that are not in computer science today. A lot of people are from in the medical science or health science, uh, but hopefully you are going to get, a, there, are, there will be some high level idea uh, in the talk that hopefully will be relevant to you, but you can ignore some of the more sort of in-depth technical part if you want, okay? All right, so as many of you know, so in the last decade, we have seen a lot of tremendous progress in the field of computer vision, machine learning, and AI in general. So for example, let's take a classic computer vision task, such as the image classification. For this task, one of the standard benchmark data set is the image net challenge. So given an input image, the goal is to classify the image into one of the predefined 1,000 categories, such as cat, dog, and car, so on and so forth. And this plot over here shows the error rate on this challenge since it was started in 2010. So you can see that the error rate keeps decreasing until around the 2016, where we have computer vision systems that are already outperforming the human performance, okay? And if you look at some other computer vision tasks, like for example, object detection, we see in the same story. So here I'm showing an image with very complicated uh, scene. So with a lot of objects and a uh, heavy occlusion. And you can, so the current state of the computer system can pretty much reliably detect all the objects and even labeling every pixel according to the object it belongs to. So if you look at an, uh, yet another computer vision task such as the human pose estimation, here I'm showing you the result of one of the state of the system and you can see that even though this is a very complicated scene, there are many different people, there are heavy occlusion, but the current system can pretty reliably detect the joints of all the people in the scene, okay? So in the past few years, we have seen the same story over and over again in many different tasks in AI. So in general, once you have a problem where you have enough training data, typically in some sense that problem is solved because you can just build a very big neural network to solve that problem, okay? So given all the amazing results we have seen so far, so the natural question is, uh, to ask is, is computer vision or machine learning or AI in general, is that really a solve the problem now? So where the field is moving in the next five to 10 years? So is there any additional technical challenge we have to overcome in order for this kind of a technology to be ubiquitous? So in order to answer that question, I want to first, take you through and uh, look at the pipeline that, uh, that people typically use for building AI systems. 
<coughs> so for any kind of a computer vision or machine learning task, typically the first thing you have to do is you have to collect a training data for that task, okay? So once you have a training data for your problem, <coughs> then building any machine learning system can pretty much follow exactly the same recipe. You take your large data set, train a machine learning model, then in the end, you get a trained model that you can deploy it for prediction, okay? So, so for example, uh, the, 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 the trained model might be deployed uh, as a web service and all the user is going to use the, the, <clears throat> this model via some kind of web interface. And uh, in, in, the, in the research, most of the research in computer vision and the machine learning has been focusing on the first two parts of this pipeline. So for example, there are a lot of work on building data sets for different tasks. So in computer vision, one of the most famous data set is so-called ImageNet, okay? And uh, there are also uh, tons of papers that try to develop all kinds of powerful machine learning models for different uh, problems. And the general trend is that the bigger model tend to give you better performance. And nowadays, in order to train those kind of very big model, typically we take advantage of the powerful GPU hardware. So for the last part of this whole pipeline, I think we haven't really seen a lot of research yet. So mostly we take the deployment part of this whole pipeline for granted. And in this talk, I'm going to argue that uh, the, this whole pipeline make a very, very important assumption, okay? So it implicitly assumes that you are going to use the same trained model for all the users or all the application scenarios, okay? And this kind of one size fits all pipeline has been made popular mainly because of a large internet company uh, like a Google or Facebook, okay? So for example, web search is perhaps one of the very early success of machine learning at a massive scale. And for, for web search, this whole pipeline makes a lot of sense because the search engine has to handle query that's coming from all over the world. So it's probably okay to assume that you are gonna have one single model sitting somewhere on the cloud serving all the users in the world, okay? And because this kind of a web, uh, web application typically runs on the cloud, so you can safely assume that you are going to have enough computing power to run the model. So overall, the deployment environment is actually pretty simple. So in the past few years, one of the clear trends in machine learning is that now this technology is starting to enter into many other industries beyond the, the consumer internet, okay? Things like uh, healthcare, agriculture, manufacturing, retail, transportation, logistic, and so on. And for many applications in these industries, running the AI model on the cloud often is not an option because of the reason like privacy, latency, and so on. So in, instead, quite often, we have to run the AI model directly on so-called edge devices. So I believe in the next five to 10 years, a lot of the innovation in AI research is gonna come from this application enabled by the edge devices. And when building intelligent system on the edge, we face some additional challenges. So for example, these edge devices, they tend to have all kinds of hardware limitation and privacy concerns. So although the application on the edge device has some special properties that makes the building AI system more difficult, such as the limited computing power, but at the same time, they have some special property that could potentially make building AI system actually easier. And ideally, we should take advantage of these properties. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on one particular property, which I call data locality, okay? So data locality just means that in many of these edge device applications, the system only need to deal with the data that are coming from a very specific domain, okay? So let's look at a concrete example. So imagine that you have a home robot, and this robot, you, you bought this robot, and you put it in your own home, okay? Now for this robot, you probably need to write some algorithm to detect faces, detect a person, detect a object in your home, okay? And for the AI models that are running on this particular robot, as long as you can reliably detect all the objects in your own home, you don't, you don't really care how well you detect the object in other people's home, okay? So in other words, for this particular robot, it only needs to handle images that are coming from a very specific home. And let's look at another example. Suppose you have a, suppose you have a surveillance camera and uh, for this camera over here, uh, you probably need to deploy some model that, uh, for example, detect objects or detect a vehicle, detect uh, uh, other objects, okay? So, for, uh, so for, for, for the model that are deployed on this particular camera, again, because the camera is fixed at the, uh, the location and the angle of the camera is fixed. 
So in other words, the images that are captured by this camera are very, very constrained, okay? So then for the model deployed on this camera, as long as it's working well on this particular camera scene, it's okay, okay? You don't really care how well it works on other cameras. So if you look at some other example, let's say for example, self-driving car, okay? So some of you might think, oh, because the car is moving around, so maybe the data is not that constrained for this application. But I'm going to argue that in most cases, uh, the car is only going to be driving within a very constrained geographical location, like within a city, okay? In that case, most of the images that the car has to do with only come from a very constrained uh, environment. In, in our case, it's a uh, one city, okay? So if you look at other applications like uh, mobile devices or variable devices or other kind of a house devices that, are, uh, uh, that uh, patients wear on their body, in most cases, those devices only need to deal with the signal that's coming from a very specific user or very specific patient, okay? So they don't really need to handle the huge diversity of all the data in the world, okay? So unfortunately, nowadays, when we build an AI system that's running on the edge device, we typically don't take advantage of this kind of a data locality property. Instead, we still largely follow this kind of one size fits all pipeline. So the only difference is now, instead of having a single model running on the cloud, we de directly deploy the model on all the user's devices, okay? And in this talk, I'm going to argue that this kind of one size fits all approach is becoming a bottleneck for building truly AI, uh, truly intelligent system. So a lot of the challenges we are facing today are largely because we are using this sort of one size fits all approach, okay? I think in order to truly build an AI uh, intelligent system on the edge, we have to rethink uh, the entire machine learning pipeline from the scratch, okay? So let me just uh, uh, mention some of the challenges that the current AI system face, okay? So one problem that many of you probably have already encountered in your own work is this so-called domain shift, okay? So, so this means that uh, like, uh, because collecting uh, data set for each application is, uh, is difficult, so the common practice is, let's say you want to build an object recognition system, typically you are going to train your model using uh, some kind of off-the-shelf data set, like uh, ImageNet, okay? Then once the model is trained, you want to deploy it on your target application, such as the surveillance camera, okay? But the problem is that the images coming from the surveillance camera, they tend to look very different from the images that are on ImageNet, okay? So if you directly deploy a model, you are going to find the performance tend to drop significantly, okay? Some of you may say, oh, I know how to solve the problem. So this, is, this, this domain shift uh, uh, is because the training data is not diverse enough. So then maybe a simple solution is I just collect more training data, okay? But I'm going to argue that larger training data is not a completely uh, solve this issue, okay? So the reason is because our, our, our natural world has this kind of a long tail distribution. So regardless of how big the data set is, you are always going to have a lot of things that appear quite often in the one day in the data set and some other things that don't appear a lot in the data set, okay? So because this kind of a long tail nature of our world, so no matter how big the data set is, there are always kind of a rare phenomena that, that are not well captured by the data set, okay? And this kind of a long tail distribution of our, ritual, uh, of our world can lead to some very negative and serious consequences. So many of you probably heard that in the news that uh, the AI model tend to amplify the bias that are already existing in data set, okay? So for example, if you train a uh, face recognition system and your data set consists of mostly images of predominantly white males, then the system is probably not gonna work well when you want to deploy it to recognize the face of other gender or other skin color, okay? Uh, another problem is that even if you can collect a big training data, you can train a big model, the issue is uh, for those kind of edge devices, they tend to have very limited computing and memory power, okay? So that means if you have a really huge model, you cannot really put those models in the edge device, okay? All right, so in this talk, I'm going to try to advocate a slightly different way of how to build an AI model, okay? So during this offline training stage, we are still going to, uh, we are just like a traditional machine learning, we are still going to learn some kind of a global generic model from some data set. But the difference is, instead of directly deploying the same model to every user or every device, what we are going to do is that based on some information about each specific user, we are going to make some small adjustment to the, 
to this generic model so that the adapted model fits the particular user better, okay? Here I'm drawing the icon of, uh, of different user, but you can imagine this could be a different application scenario or different domain and so on, okay? So typically this kind of a offline training stage, you can do it on the cloud uh, or on some kind of a uh, powerful GPU server. And uh, the adaptation typically is done on the user's edge device. Okay. All right, so, so in the rest of the talk, I'm going to present several, uh, several different uh, approaches that we have worked on for different uh, computer vision applications. Uh, so, but it's important to keep in mind that uh, this, this idea is quite general. So even though I'm talking about a computer vision application in the talk, but hopefully the technique can be also be used for application beyond the computer vision, okay? So let's start with the first, uh, uh, first uh, piece of work on, I call it a scene adaptation using MetaLens, okay? Okay, so I'm going to use the crowd counting application as a running example, okay? So for this problem, uh, the problem setup is like this, okay? So given an image of a, uh, of a crowd captured maybe by a surveillance camera, okay? Then the goal is to estimate how many people are there in the image, okay? So most of the crowd counting uh, method are based on estimating something called the crowd density map given an image, okay? So the idea is you, are, you train a model that takes an image as input and produces this kind of a density map as output. And each pixel in the density map is a number indicating the level of density at the corresponding location in the image, okay? So once you have this density map, then in order to get the total count, all you need to do is just to sum over all the values of this density map. This will tell you how many people are there in the image, okay? So the key of building a crowd counting system is how to build a model that estimates this density map. So in the literature, most of the approach is based on supervised learning. So the idea is you just collect a, a large training data where you have this kind of a paired of input image and the uh, ground truth density map. Then you throw that into a deep neural network learning uh, approach. Then in the end, you are gonna get a, a trained crowd hunting model, okay? All right, but the key, but the, now let's consider, suppose I want to train this crowd hunting model, how we are going to collect the training data. Okay, so one approach is you could collect the training data from one camera scene, okay? In fact, some of the benchmark data set used in the literature are collected in this way. But the issue is, if you use this kind of a training data, the model is probably gonna overfit to this particular camera scene. So if you try to deploy the model in a different camera scene, it's probably not gonna work well. So a better approach perhaps is now we can, we can try to collect the training image from many different camera scenes, okay? In this case, the model is not going to overfit to a particular camera scene, but the issue is the, if you use this kind of a training data, the model you trained is going to be too generic, okay? So the model is not going to take advantage of the fact that during deployment, your test image are coming from the same, uh, same camera scene. So in other words, it's not taking advantage of this data locality property in deployment, okay? So our goal is this work is that during deployment, we are gonna assume that we can capture a very small number of labeled images from the target scene. And our goal is to learn a generic model so that during deployment, we can quickly adapt the, this kind of a generic model to that uh, uh, target camera using only a very few examples. So let me, uh, let me uh, uh, de uh, describe what our problem setup look like, okay? So during the offline training, we are going to assume that we have training data that are collected from many different camera scenes. So each of the, uh, so, so for example, so for a particular camera scene, we are going to have a collection of images and they are going to choose density map, okay? So then uh, we also have, the, the images are, the training data are collected from many different camera scenes, okay? Then from this kind of training data, what we want to do is we want to learn a sort of a generic model parameterized by theta. Then during deployment, we are given a new camera scene that, are not, that we haven't encountered during the offline training state yet, okay? Then for this new camera scene, we are going to assume that we have a small amount of label data that are captured by this, uh, that are collected from this target scene, okay? Then from this small amount of uh, label data, what we want to do is we want to quickly adapt this global model theta into theta tilde, where theta tilde is somehow tailored to this camera scene, 
okay? So the key thing here is that the number of images that we have during the deployment stage has to be very small because during deployment, you cannot really ask the user to collect hundreds of millions of images for you. So you can only ask them to collect maybe one to five images. Okay, so, so, so this K here has to be a very small number. So then the question is, how do we learn this uh, global model theta so that it can quickly adapt to a, a new camera scene with only a small amount of data, okay? So here for this, for this application, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I have different camera scene, but you can imagine this uh, depending on application, this could be different user or different domain and so on and so forth, okay? All right, so, so then the technique we are going to use is something called meta-learning. So the, so the high level idea of meta-learning is you construct something called a task during so-called meta-training state, okay? So this meta-training state is done offline where during the meta-training stage, you are going to construct a lot of tasks that is, uh, that's used to simulate what's going to happen during testing, okay? Then through this meta-training stage, you are going to learn some global parameter theta that are effective for adaptation during deployment, okay? Then during testing uh, or, or, or during so-called meta-testing, what you do is you are going to, be, you are going to encounter an, another task that are somehow similar to the task that you see during meta-training then you are going to use the data you have in this new task to quickly adapt your model, okay? All right, so now let's, let's look at how we can use this kind of meta learning idea in our crowdfunding application. So let's first uh, look at how we, set up our, uh, uh, how we set up our data, okay? So remember in meta learning, you have a meta training stage and then you have a meta testing stage. So during meta training stages, so this is how we set up our data, data set, okay? So remember I mentioned that during offline training, we have images that are captured from different camera scenes. Then what we are going to do is for each of the camera scene, we are going to split the data from that camera scene into its own training and its own test data. So each of the tau here corresponds to a camera scene during meta training, okay? So for example, tau one is the first, uh, first camera scene uh, on, the, on the meta training data, okay? Then what we do is we split the images well, we split the training image from tau one into its own training data and its own testing. And we do, we do the same thing for all the other training data, okay? Then during meta testing, what we do, what we have is we are gonna encounter a new camera scene. Then for that new camera scene, we are going to have only a very small number of images. That will be the training data for that, uh, for that uh, target scene, okay? Then what we want to do is we want to quickly adapt our model using this training data. Then we are going to test our model using other images or test the images from that target scene, okay? All right, so the key thing here is here when we split our data in this way, we have to make sure that the, this K here has to be very small because remember I mentioned that in meta learning, the idea is during meta training stage, you want to simulate what's going to happen during deployment, okay? Because we know that during deployment, we only have a very small amount of uh, training data for a target scene, which means during meta training, we have to simulate the same situation using our meta training data set, okay? All right, so now let's, uh, let's look at uh, the algorithm. So this, this is something that if you, are not, if you don't want to, <laughs> to, if you don't care about the technical detail, you can, you, can, you can ignore, but this is mostly for people are with a little bit technical background, okay? So here is what our algorithm looks like. So we start with a global parameter theta. So this is our generic global model. Then during one iteration of the training, what we are gonna do is we are gonna sample several training scenes in this iteration, okay? Then for each of the sample scene, what we are going to do is we are going to do a little bit of adaptation using the training data specific for that sample the training scene. So for example, uh, imagine that a tau one is one of the sample scene. What we are going to do is we are going to use the training data of tau one to adapt our model from theta to become theta one tilde, okay? Then theta one tilde is going to specifically tailor to this, uh, 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 this scene, tau one, okay? Then what we are going to do is we are going to, for each of the sample scene, we are going to evaluate how well the adapted model parameter is using the test data for that training scene, okay? So remember, tau one is a training scene. So it has its own training data and its own test data, okay? Then we are going to use its own test data to evaluate how well the adapted model is, okay? 
Then what we are going to do is we are going to accumulate the information across all the uh, sampled uh, scene in this iteration. Then we make a then we update our global model according to the accumulated loss through uh, across these different time, uh, sampled things. Okay. Then we just repeat this process many iterations until it converge. Okay. All right, so now let's look at some of the uh, some of the detail of how this uh, how this adaptation is done. Okay, so so in the inner loop, so so remember in the uh, so in uh, so let's look at what happens in the inner loop of the software. Okay, so in the inner loop, what we have is we let's look at how we adapt the global parameter to a specific sample scene. Okay, so imagine you have a sample scene that's called a tau i. Then the way we do the adaptation is that we just use a very simple gradient descent. Okay, so remember the sample scene has a small amount of training data of its own. Then what we the way we do the adaptation is we just calculate the loss on the on the training data corresponding to the sample scene. Then take a few gradient update. Okay, this is how we get this uh, adapted model for this sample scene. Okay. Then after we get the adapted model, we have to some we have to have a way to evaluate how well the adapted model is performing, and the way we do that is we just evaluate on the test data corresponding to tau uh, tau i. Okay, so remember for each of the sample thing, it has its own training data and its own test data. So we use its own training data to do the model adaptation. Then we use its own test data to to evaluate how well the adapted model is doing. Okay. So, so basically, this loss here is calculated on the test data corresponding to this sample scene. So then in the outer loop, then what we are going to do is we just accumulate the, uh, the, the loss uh, across all the sample scene. Then this will give us a total loss. Then we just take a gradient update on that uh, uh, on the global model parameter scene. Okay. All right. So without getting too much into the detail, let's let's just look at some of the experimental results. So here is uh, one of the results. Of course, we have more results in the paper as well. So here I'm showing the error. So smaller number means better. You can see that our model outperforms the other approaches that are not doing adaptation. Okay. Uh, so we we have also so that's the end of the crowd counting. But we have we also use the same idea in some other applications. So for example, we use it for anomaly detection in videos. So for this problem, the, the, the setup is you have an offline training stage where you have, you have collected a lot of video. And in those videos, you only have normal behavior. Then what you want to do is you want to learn the model so that during deployment, you want to de uh, uh, there might be some anomaly, abnormal behavior in your, in your test video. Then you want to be able to identify this anomaly. So, so the traditional, uh, in most of the previous work, what they do is they just learn one generic uh, uh, anomaly detection model, then they just assume that uh, this model can be deployed. But uh, again, you, uh, in most of this, uh, those kind of uh, applications that uh, involve anomaly detection, so typically those cameras that do not move, like uh, maybe in surveillance case, okay? So in this case, it doesn't really make sense to learn a generic model. So instead, uh, you want to learn the model that has specific data to every camera. So we use exactly the same uh, meta-learning approach so that uh, during training, we have video that are captured by many different surveillance cameras. Then we use meta-learning to learn the model. So then during deployment, our model is gonna observe the first few frames of the test video, then adapt itself to the target camera. Then it's gonna do the anomaly detection in the rest of the frame, okay? So um, again, without getting too much into the detail, let me, let's just look at some result. So here I'm showing accuracy. So uh, higher means better. You can see that our uh, approach is, are significantly better than other approach uh, that are not doing this kind of adaptation, okay? So I'm particularly excited about the last result because th for this data set over here, it's not even RGB uh, video. So the data actually are depth image. So even though our training uh, data only consists of video of regular RGB images, but uh, we can actually adapt our model to depth image as well, and it actually works quite well. All right, so, so that's the first part of the talk. So now let me move on to uh, the second part of which uh, is uh, uh, so-called adaptation using hyper network, okay? So, so after we did this crowd counting work uh, I, showed in the, uh, I showed earlier, uh, we are not completely satisfied. So the reason is because 
the work I just described still requires that during deployment, you need to have a small amount of label data, okay? So although the number of label data is not that big, it typically is one to five, but still you need to have the user to label those images for you. And quite often, uh, this is a, too much to ask for the users, okay? So ideally what we want to do is we want to do this kind of a model adaptation without asking user to label anything, okay? So in this, so basically then multiply, uh, multiply this observation, we have the follow-up work where we do this adaptation only use unlabeled data from the, from, the data, from the user, okay? Because asking the user just take a few pictures is actually quite easy, okay? So that's not a really uh, very expensive to ask, but ask them to label data is gonna be very, very expensive, okay? So, so then the idea of this work is that we want to adapt the, our model to a, a target camera only using unlabeled images captured by that camera, okay? All right, so then the problem set up, uh, during the offline training, the problem set up is almost exactly like the previous one. So during training, we have images and there are ground truths, and those images uh, are captured from many different uh, uh, camera scenes, okay? The difference is that during deployment, we have a target camera. Now in this case, we only have several, uh, a very small amount of unlabeled images from the, from the target camera. Then through using that unlabeled image, we want to quickly adapt our model to this uh, new target camera, okay? All right, so this is what our model looks like, okay? So, so in the first row here, this is just a standard crowd counting uh, network, okay? So basically this network is gonna take an uh, image and uh, produce, the, uh, produce the density map as the output, okay? So the special thing about this network is that uh, there are some, there's, we insert some special layer. Here we call it the guided batch normalization layer, okay? And for these layer, they have some uh, parameter in those layer but the parameters of those layer are not learned with the rest of the uh, parameter uh, in this network. Instead, those parameters are directly produced by another network, we call it the guiding network, okay? What the guiding network is going to do is, it's going to take an image from a particular camera scene at input and directly produce the parameter for those GBN layer in the crowd hunting network, okay? So this is a this is a little different from the, uh, the 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 standard way of using neural network. So in standard neural network, typically the output is some kind of a label, okay. But here the output of the guiding network is not a label; it's the parameter for another neural network, okay. And because the uh, because like uh, for example, if you have a different camera scene, the, the this input to the guiding network is going to be different, which means the parameter in the GBN layer in the crowd counting network is going to be different for different camera scenes, which means the crowd counting network is going to be slightly different for different uh, camera scenes. So this is how we achieve the, uh, 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 the scene adaptation, okay? And also notice that in this whole thing over here, the, there, we only need to define a loss at the very end. So we don't really need the, we don't really need the ground truth for the images that are uh, use the input for the guiding network. So that means when we do the adaptation, we actually don't really need the ground truth for the, for the end user. We just need a few unlabeled images, okay? All right, so uh, again, without getting too much into detail, let's just look at the result. So here I'm, I'm showing, uh, again, I'm showing the error. So you can see that our approach outperform other alternatives, okay? All right, so so then we also use the almost exactly the same idea for another problem called the highlight detection into the vision, okay? So for highlight detection, the goal is you are given a long video, maybe several hour video. You want to create a, uh, something called the highlight or moment from this video, okay? So for example, uh, your input video could be a several hour soccer game, and maybe those highlights could be those short clips corresponding to someone, uh, someone uh, uh, like a, uh, get, a, get a point or something like that, okay? All right, so, but the, the issue is in the literature, most of the highlight detection assume that you are going to train a generic highlight detection model and all the user is going to use exactly the same model, okay? But the problem is for different users, they tend to have a different opinion on what they consider to be a highlight, okay? 
So then in this work, what we want to do is we want to achieve something called the personalization in highlight detection, okay? In other words, we want the highlight detection model to adapt to each user based on the user preference. So in particular, we are going to, uh, in this particular work, what we assume is that we know something about the user history. So in particular, the user history is in the form of, of highlight that a particular user has previously created, okay? So we assume the user has created some highlight before, and those highlights tell us some, some information about what kind of things this, kind of, this user is interested in, okay? Then what we want to do is based on the user history, we want to create a personalized highlight detection so that this highlight detection model is tailored to the user's preference. All right, so, so our model is, is, is gonna look almost exactly like the unlabeled uh, scene adaptation for the product hunting uh, work, okay? So basically the first row here is just the standard highlight detection model, which takes the original video and produce the highlight. Then in this network here, there are some special layer with, our, with some parameter in those layer. And the parameter in those layer are gonna be created by another neural network here we call it the history encoder network, okay? Then this history encoder network is going to take the user history as input and directly produce a parameter in this highlight uh, network, okay? So it's exactly the same idea as before. So, so let's look at some of the results. So you can see that our results are uh, out of other approach that are not doing this kind of personalization, okay? All right, so finally, I want to uh, briefly mention another work that we have done uh, recently on something called test time adaptation using meta auxiliary learning, okay? So for this work, we are going to consider this application of image deep blur, okay? In particular, we are looking at a so-called dynamics in deep blur. So the, the problem setup is you are given a blurry image, so the, the blur could come from many different factors. So for example, maybe the camera is moving or you have background moving or the main object in the image is moving, okay? So all these factors create this kind of a blur in the end. Then what we want to do is we want to take the blurry image as input and produce a clean or de-blurred image as output. So, so the, the common way of solving this problem uh, is that you just treat it as a supervised learning. So you have a training data where you have this kind of a paired of input blur and the uh, clean image as the output. Then you just learn the neural network from those kind of training data, okay? But the, the observation is that in that case, the model you, un, you un, end up with is gonna be generic, okay? So it doesn't really take advantage of the very specific property of a particular test image, okay? So then in this work, what we want to do is we want to do this something called the test time adaptation. In other words, given a test image, we are going to adapt our model a little bit based on this particular test limit, okay? Then hopefully the adapted model is gonna perform better than uh, uh, for this particular test limit, okay? So the idea, so the, our, at a high level, here is uh, how we construct our, our approach, okay? So we are going to assume that uh, in addition to the primary task, which is image deep blur, we are gonna attach another so-called algorithmic task into the network, okay? The key thing is this algorithm has, has to be something called a self-supervised. In other words, this task has to be something that does not require any additional label, okay? So suppose you can construct this kind of a task. Then what you do is during testing, you can just do a few gradient updates based on the loss in the algorithm task, okay? So in other words, this, uh, this uh, uh, backbone network is going to change at the test time, okay? Then once it's changed over time, then you just use the update model to perform your primary task, which is a deep learning, okay? All right, so then for this particular application, this is how we uh, design our network, okay? So we, our network is gonna have a backbone. This will be used to extract a feature. Then we attach two decoder from this backbone, okay? So one de decoder is gonna be used to perform the primary task, which is a deep learning. Then the second is going to, uh, a branch is going to perform another auxiliary task, which is image reconstruction, okay? And for image reconstruction, you don't really need any supervision because you can just define the loss based on the original image. So this is self-supervised, okay? All right, so, 
Now let's look at how we do the learning. Okay, so for doing for doing learning, we are going to use something called the meta aggregated learning. So this is how it works. So in one particular iteration, we are going to sample a particular training image from our data set. Okay. Then what we are going to do is so so this theta here is going to be our original global parameter. Okay. Then what we are going to do is we are going to do a little bit of adaptation using the algorithm task uh, defined on this input image. Okay. So remember the algorithm task is self-supervised, so it doesn't really require any label. So so we just use the self-supervised loss to do a few uh, model to do a few gradient update. So this is how we got the adapted parameter for this test limit. Then once we have the adapted model, we are going to use the adapted model to perform the primary task, which is the deep learning. Okay, so this will be the output from the primary branch. Then what we are going to do is remember this is a training image, which means we have the ground truth for the deep learning task. Then we just uh, define the loss by measuring how well the deep learning is doing on this image. Then we uh, we do a few gradient update on the global model. This, then we just repeat this process many uh, iterations. So the high level idea is during learning, we are going to learn how to do the adaptation through this self-supervised algorithm task so that our primary task will get better for a particular test limit. Okay. All right, so, so now let's look at some of the uh, quanti uh, quantity examples. So you can see that our approach, again, we out of perform out, uh, other uh, alternatives, okay? So here are some qualitative examples. So, uh, so this is uh, like during, adapt uh, during testing, you can actually choose to, uh, uh, how many iterations you want to adapt, okay? So here I'm showing you the result of just adapting the model for different number of iterations, okay? All right, so uh, yeah, so to summarize, so I have introduced uh, 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 several pieces of work towards the goal of building AI system that adapt to every user or every domain or every application. So I introduced uh, uh, three different approach uh, using meta learning or using hyper network or using meta algorithm uh, learning, okay? Uh, I think there are a lot of very interesting follow-up work that uh, uh, along this line of research. So for example, right now we assume that you only do the adaptation once during deployment. But a very interesting uh, follow-up will be, how do you do this kind of continuous adaptation? So while the model is interacting with the user, can it adapt periodically according to how well it's performing, okay? Uh, so uh, at the moment, the meta training stage still has to be done on the centralized server or the, on the cloud. But can we do it in a federated way where we don't really need a centralized server to store all the information from different users, okay? Then another direction I'm very interested in is how do we do, uh, right now we only do model parameter adaptation. Then a very interesting question is how do we do, uh, adapt the structure as well, okay? So imagine you train a big model, but when you do the adaptation, you somehow do a compression of the model so that it becomes smaller. Um, so another direction I'm very interested in is kind of a combining adaptation with active exploration. Because right now we assume that when we do the adaptation, there is no user input. But imagine that if you have a robot and the robot can actually decide where to collect the, uh, collect the, the image to, for adaptation. So in that case, you have to combine this kind of adaptation with the exploration or the action of the robot. So I think there is gonna be a lot of a technical challenge and interesting research question there. Uh, but of course, there are many, many different applications that hopefully can take advantage of this idea. And uh, I'm looking forward to talk uh, to anyone if you are interested. Uh, finally, I want to acknowledge all the uh, former and uh, current students I have uh, at Manitoba who work on uh, all the work that I discussed, and also some of the colleagues at Huawei that were that work with me on the last few years. And uh, I have about a ten minute uh, ten minutes left, so I'm happy to take any questions if you have. Thanks. Wow. That was an enormous amount of, uh, of uh, information. Thank you so much. This is a wonderful kickoff to the to the academic year. So many concepts to uh, to absorb and to, uh, uh, to to think about. I'll I'll uh, open it up to to uh, anyone uh, that wants to wants to jump in. Well. I'll start with a comment and a question. Thanks, Yang, that was really interesting. Um, I, I think about some of these um, 
uh, really collections of images. You talked about uh, ImageNet as being one that are collecting that are collecting images, and I'm not so familiar with it. But I wonder about how um, how increasing diversity is being represented in something like ImageNet. So is it a public domain? Are there specific you know goals in terms of trying to create diversity in terms of images that would help with what you describe as the curve and identifying mm -hmm. some of these outliers, mm -hmm. because uh, mm -hmm. you know that seems to be a goal in terms of trying to capture as many scenarios as possible. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I think right now, at, at least at the moment, I think that's still a very active research. I don't think there is a very reliable solution yet. But this issue of diversity or fairness, uh, or whatever you call it, is something that uh, a lot of people are in AI and machine learning are thinking about right now. But I don't think there is a good solution yet. So uh, that right now, there are some there are people there are people who work with this, uh, who create some kind of a guideline of how to create a uh, basically things to consider when you are creating the data set. <laughs> so so yeah, so there, there are some work, but but right, I would say the. Is that still an open question? Yes, criteria around that. And also then, you know, you, there are two sides of it. You talk about um, about these adaptive approaches. Mm -hmm. um, and then yeah. the other side of it is possibly, you know, um, around sampling. And so yeah. really doing oversampling of certain kinds of images that may be problematic or um, uh, mm -hmm. that might be used in terms of some of these detection problems. So I see that as being another piece, but you still have to have that, you know, that training data set that's sufficiently diverse. Right, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, no So that was actually sort of the theme that I was thinking about is uh, I realize you're a computer scientist, but the social implications of personalization, adaptation, and presentation of, uh, of information that reinforces behaviors. So I was thinking about the, 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 uh, the, the people viewing the, uh, the same video and getting presented different highlights. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, obviously, the 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 ability to do that is is a wonderful advance of the technology. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but uh, I guess there there are are potential social implications. Mm -hmm. Do you do you do you think about that? Um, in the highlight detection work, we we are not. <laughs> so this that's mostly a technical sort of a, a project. But I I agree that like a. Uh, like uh, this kind of a social or uh, social aspect of AI is something that a very uh, like it's a very hot topic in AI right now because uh, nowadays AI finally is starting to enter <laughs> into many applications. Then we find that there are a lot of uh, social issues we haven't really thought about yet. Right. No, I wasn't thinking so much about a soccer game. I don't think there's 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 too much uh, harm harm there. But uh, uh, in news presentations and other other things uh, could. Uh, Obviously, have uh, different implications. Any, any, anyone else want to jump in, please? I was thinking, uh, you know, the the work that uh, Barrett's doing, trying to uh, 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 develop more flexible algorithms for vertebral fracture detection off of different types of. Uh, of uh, of scanners uh, uh, may may actually be able to benefit from benefit from something here, uh, because uh, rather than trying to build the mother of all uh, CNNs that can accept uh, every type of uh, of uh, 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 scan input and uh, perform equally well across all of them, maybe in fact, as you said, uh, you you need to uh, to uh, Break that out into into uh, 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 sort of a, a, a meta uh, structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm glad you bring it up. So I I have the, I actually have this example on my slide, but I didn't really talk about too much in detail. So uh, yeah, you are exactly right. So so I think you know a lot of medical application, especially this. I think I believe this technology can really benefit because, for example, like uh, you you have some kind of a scan. Imagine that you collect those scan image from many different hospitals, okay? But when you deploy it to a particular hospital, the scanner doesn't really move. So it has some very specific properties specifically for that hospital. 
then in that case, it doesn't really make sense to build a model that uh, directly applied to all hospitals. Instead, you can adapt it to, the, to a particular hospital when you deploy it. Yeah, exactly. yeah great. Rob, yeah, it looks like you're unmuted. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to, um, I mean, thank you, the wonderful stuff. This is this is such a cool area, uh, and, and so far outside of what, what I get to do, but it, it's the, the, the place where, where regulatory um, issues arise, you know, sort of in the medical devices field. And I'm just wondering, are, are people trying to grapple with how quickly something that is adapting to a local situation, mm -hmm. how quickly it departs from the, the device that was originally approved? And, and, and it might be, this might be just a bit too niche, but are, are there people who are working on uh, trying to measure that rate of departure from the original device's settings, mm -hmm. you know, like okay. a, a, as, your, as your neural net becomes mm -hmm. your neural net and not the one that, that was originally deployed, mm -hmm. um, how quickly could it co start to, to, to no longer have the characteristics that the device was originally approved under? And, right, right, mm -hmm. right, that's, that's a very good point. So, so the, uh, so the answer is, at least right now, is that yeah. when we do this adaptation, we make sure that we only do the gradient, we only do a small amount of gradient update. Yeah. Okay. Because otherwise the model could just deviate too much from the global model. <clears throat> yeah, that's a short answer. So that's okay. why that's why I think this kind of a, like I mentioned in my future work. So this kind of a continuous adaptation, I think it's gonna be a technical challenge because yeah, we do yeah, continuous it, adaptation, you don't want to deviate too much from the original. Yeah, that's that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I the you know the the regulatory in, environment has got has, they've got very strict rules they 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 or at least they you know they feel they've got very strict rules for for what what would need to be done to approve a device has anybody has are are these adapt, adapting methods are they are they encroaching on regulatory um, I, uh, okay it, uh -huh. phrasing this poorly um, I, I I understand what you mean so so. Uh, I don't, because I think that this approach is still at the very cutting edge of research. I don't think it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's probably, we are not there yet. <laughs> like, yeah, okay. This way. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Okay, anyone else? Well, <clears throat> I just have one more question or comment. When um, <laughs> I'm intrigued by this idea of the, <laughs> the federated um, meta training, because we do something uh, similar in, um, in statistical modeling, uh, you know, uh, meta-analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, and <clears throat> one of the challenges uh, there is um, uh, really being able to detect uh, out, you know, outliers in terms of, um, mm -hmm. of the data or the models. Uh, and so I'd just like to hear your comments on that too, with respect to this kind of meta training. You know, when do you decide that you can't include a particular site or a particular model uh, mm -hmm. would be, I think, an issue with trying to do this distributed analysis. Right, right. So, so in, in machine learning, there is an entire area called federated learning that's trying to uh, study how to learn in this kind of distributed fashion. So how to decide, because in that context, the one problem they are facing is maybe you have some users that are adversarial. So they are trying to break your federated learning algorithm. So you want to be able to detect those so-called outlier or in our case, it's adversarial participants. So th there are some research doing that. So uh, again, it's a, it's a very uh, frontier kind of actual research. I, I don't think it's right now, it's, it's ready for, for <laughs> prime time yet, but, but it's, it's, it's definitely very, very active. Yeah. Uh, thanks, okay. Yang. Lots of challenges with trying yeah. to do uh, this yeah. kind of work, but but yeah. makes sense yeah. when I think about it from a statistical perspective. That very much yeah. is the distributed analysis are mm -hmm. very much the way forward to work across diverse mm -hmm. sites uh, mm -hmm. or where it's not possible to actually take data and combine it. So I can mm -hmm. see that yeah. happening yeah. in this in this kind of environment as well. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And, and with that, I think we're going to draw this to a close because Yang has a meeting to get ready for in exactly uh, five minutes. So, uh, so thank you once again. Superb talk. Uh, great discussion. And uh, uh, 
carry on great uh, uh, great and look forward to speaking with and seeing everybody again in uh, in four weeks yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. great thanks Bye. everybody for joining thanks yang for thank presenting you. today no, good yeah. way to kick us off for the new okay. year thank you <laughs> Bye.